let's start our closing section. It will be with, with Wilson Mendonça. Wilson Mendonça is a professor at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. He also teaches at the graduate program for philosophy, the same university. There he coordinates the Center for, Center for Ethics and Philosophy of Mind for a long time now. Um, he organized two, two very uh, important conferences in the last years. Firstly, in 2013 with Dave Chalmers and Claudia Passos. He organized this uh, huge conference on phenomenal concepts in Rio. And then in 2015, he organized a conference on meta-ethics with Dave Kopp. Well, uh, Wilson, uh, I think, is it okay, the mic? I'm too close? Okay. Uh, Wilson came for conferences here in, in Saint Jean de Rey, or conferences that were organized by our group at the Federal University of Saint Jean de Rey a couple of times now. This is probably the third or the fourth time. So he collaborates with us a lot. We are very happy to, to have him here. And I'll pass him the word to start. OK. Well, it seems I have the last word in this terrific conference. <laughs> and I wish the last word could be simply thank you. Thank you very much, Rodrigo, Marco, and Gustavo for organizing this terrific conference. I'm glad, yeah, really. I wish also to say thank you. This may seem strange at the first sight, but it's not. I would like to thank David Chalmers, especially. I think everyone know, everyone here knows or recognizes that a workshop or a conference with David Chalmers is a very special philosophical event. It's very different, qualitatively different from any other workshop without David Chalmers. I thank you for your <laughs> OK, let me tell you what I'll do here. Uh, OK, the title is Scrutinizing the Conceivability Argument Against Physicalism. It is a pity that the title couldn't be Scrutinizing the Scrutability Argument. It would be <laughs> a much, much more interesting title. But anyway, I will try to isolate here uh, an assumption, a very central assumption, in the conceivability argument. I will reconstruct the conceivability argument, try to isolate this assumption, and I will make some remarks, critical remarks, about the grounds offered in support of this assumption. I have, of course, no, I say from the beginning, I have no knockdown argument against this assumption, but I would like to express a worry about the conservability argument, and I think this worry is interesting in, in itself. Okay, I begin <coughs> with a, an initial, more or less informal statement of the conservability argument. Uh, a quote by David Chalmers, 2003. It is conceivable that there is, that, that, that there be a system that is physically identical to a conscious being, but that lacks at least some of that being's conscious states. Such a system might be a zombie, a system that is physically identical to a conscious being, but that lacks consciousness entirely. Many hold that zombies are at least conceivable. We can coherently imagine zombies, and there is no contradiction in the idea that reveals itself even on reflection. From the conceivability of zombies, proponents of the argument infer their metaphysical possibility. From here, it is inferred that consciousness must be non-physical, if there is a metaphysically possible universe that it is physically identical to ours, but that lacks consciousness, then consciousness must be a further 
non-physical component of our universe. I'll try to put the main ideas here in uh, more, of, more or less formal terms. I begin with physicalism. Physicalism or materialism, which is the same, physicalism about the phenomenal is the claim that phenomenal truths are necessitated, that is, metaphysically entailed by physical truths. If P is the conjunction of all microphysical truths about a conscious being in our world, including physical laws, and Q states truly that this being instantiates a certain phenomenal property, then the claim of physicalism about the phenomenal can be put in formal terms like that, necessarily, if P, then Q. Metaphysically necessary, of course. No? Okay, and this is of course equivalent to it's not possible that P and non Q. <coughs> Thus, according to the usual interpretation of the model operators, physicalism about the phenomenal amounts to the thesis that any world in which P and non Q is true is metaphysically impossible. The operative idea behind the conservability argument is to infer possibly P and non Q, that is the falsity of physicalism, from the fact that we can conceive P and non Q. This is at least part of what is meant by the slogan, conceivability is a guide to possibility. Conceivability is of course no immediate guide to possibility, if it were, we could infer the existence of a possible world where water isn't H2O from the fact that we can conceive water is different from H2O. I'm assuming, as I think you have to assume, I'm assuming here that in whatever reasonable sense in which P and non-Q is conceivable, water is different from H2O is also conceivable. We can grant that to conceive P and non-Q is to envision a whole scenario in which P and non-Q is true. We can, we can also agree with the characterization of this scenario as a sort of world, a maximally specific way things might be. Then to conceive P and non-Q amounts to holding that a zombie could exist in a world very different from our world. However, we must distinguish scenarios and worlds in that sense from the metaphysically possible worlds that are, that, that are usually characterized as maximally specific ways things might have been. Otherwise, we would get the wrong result that water isn't necessarily H2O. Or assuming again that water is different from H2O isn't less conceivable than P and non-Q, there is a scenario where water and H2O are different things. But it would be wrong to infer from this that we are having to do here with a real possibility that water could objectively have gone unaccompanied by H2O. Thus the conceivability argument must carefully distinguish the space of scenarios, the space of points or circumstances where sentences can be evaluated for truth from the space of metaphysical possibility where sentences can also be evaluated for truth. That is, truth in a scenario is a somehow different notion from truth in a world. To make good the idea that the conceivability is a guide to real objective possibility, the conceivability argument must also assume the availability of a bridging principle. This is my terminology, the availability of a bridging principle, linking the space of possibilities constitutively associated with conceivability 
on the one hand, and the admittedly distinct metaphysical space on the other hand. The conceivability argument invokes this bridging principle to infer the objective existence of a world where the physical doesn't determine the phenomenal from the existence of a conceivable scenario where P and non-Q is true. However, the required bridging principle must be such that the existence of a world where water doesn't follow from a scenario that verifies water is different from H2O. After going then in, into the details of the bridging principle, as I'm calling it, and the role it plays in the conservability argument, I will take issue with the grounds offered in its support. Then first to the other pieces in the conservability argument. Uh, let there be S be a relation between a scenario V and a sentence S, which obtains or which is true when V verifies S, that is, when S is true in V. Let set W S be a relation between a metaphysically possible word W and a sentence S, which obtains when W satisfies S, that is, when S is true in W. The verification and the satisfaction of a sentence corresponds to different forms of semantic evaluation. The circumstances of evaluation in each case are categorically distinct conceivable scenarios in one case, metaphysical worlds in the other case. Then I introduce another uh, relation, which I, which I call verification star. Assuming now the availability of the bridging principle mentioned above, we can designate with W sub V the metaphysically possible world associated via the bridging principle with the scenario V, that explain W sub V. Then we can define a relation, verificate VR star, W, V, and S, between words and sentences, which is true when the correspondence VAR relation is true. And there are two different relations, one relation concerns scenarios, the other relation concerns words, but one relation depends on the other. There is a connection between both relations. Okay. Uh, now putting some pieces together at least. Now let S be water is H2O. What we conceive in this case is a scenario that verifies the hypothesis that water is a different stuff from H2O. In formal terms, there from V and water is different from H2O is true. And this means water is different from H2O is conceivable. This relation is not at all problematic. Okay, given the bridging principle, there is a metaphysically possible word W sub V, which verifies the star the idea that water and H2O are essentially different things. In formal terms, very star W sub V and water is different from H2O is true. Okay. A good candidate, a good candidate for WV in this case is Putnam's Twinner, a possible world where the watery stuff is XYZ different from H2O. But this is a world where water is H2O. Thus we have set W sub V and water is different from H2O is false. 
And this is the desired combination, okay? Verification, verstar, and set is false. Verification is true and set is false. Okay? That's it. The, the, the conjunction in, put it again. The conjunction of verification star of W sub V in water is different from H2O, and the denial of sat W sub V water is different from H2O reflects what we independently expect. Water is different from H2O, may be conceivable, but it doesn't represent a real possibility. Compare now with this the case where S, the sentence S, is P and non-Q. We have, of course, almost by definition, where V and P and non-Q is true. But V is the scenario that verifies P and non-Q. Okay? Assuming the availability of BP, we have, we also have, verification star of W sub V and P and non Q is true. Okay. There is a word associated to the scenario V, and in this word, uh, P and non Q is verified star. Okay. Further, a distinctive aspect of P and non-Q which is not shared by water is different from H2O ensures that the very same words W sub V, the, the very same words that verifies the star P and non-Q also satisfies it. There is a special, a distinctive aspect of P and Q. I will comment presently on this aspect, what this aspect is. But anyway, set W sub V and P and non-Q is true. There is the conjunction of ver star on W, V and P and non-Q and set W, V and P and non-Q means that zombies are not merely conceivable, they are really possible. And in this case, Situation is very different from the former case. Water, water is being different from H2O. Okay. Uh, this distinctive aspect has to do with this, this, with this distinction between primary and secondary intentions. The distinctive aspect of P and non Q responsible for the right result, the objectivity possibility of zombies, has to do with the fact that the framework which has been characterized so far allows the association of two different intentions to any conceivable sentence S. There is first of all the secondary intention of S, which is a mapping, a function mapping, words W sub V to set WV And there is also the primary intention, of course, that maps the ordered pairs consisting of a world WV, the same world, considered first as counterfactual and then as actual, that maps this ordered pair to their star WV and S. Now, if we start from the usual two-dimensional representation and start from the two-dimensional representation, usual, for instance, in double index semantics, and let the words WV considered as actual play the role of contexts of uterines, which are usually put in the vertical, okay, while the words W sub V considered as counterfactual play the role of contexts of secondary evaluation, then the result is that the primary intention is diagonal, while the secondary intention is horizontal. And this graphic representation of the primary and the secondary intention uh, helps to see 
why you can infer the possibility from a zombie, from the real possibility of a zombie, but you can't infer the possibility of the real possibility of waters not being H2O. Okay, this is because, uh, okay, it can be easily seen that if the primary and the secondary intentions of S coincide, then any world, WV, W sub V, the refined star S, will also satisfy us. If you find a V, a truth value, no T, in the diagonal, then, uh, and if the, second, the primary intention coincides with the, 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 the secondary intention, then you find a T also in the horizon, the horizontal, okay? Okay, it is accepted by virtually everyone that the terms composing Q ensure that its primary and secondary intentions coincide. And many philosophers hold that mutatis mutandis, this equally applies to B. Okay, many people hold that what applies to Q, namely that the primary intention and the secondary intention coincide, this applies also to P. By the way, David is one of those philosophers that don't accept that this applies equally to P. I will ignore this extra step in the argument because, okay, you, you, maybe you know this, uh, if, 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 you, if, you, if you take in, into consideration the fact that very likely the primary intention of P doesn't coincide with uh, the secondary intention, then you can't infer uh, the negation of, of the denial of physicalism from the, from the argument. But in that case, you would infer the truth of Russellian monism, which is no, I, I propose simply to ignore this, okay? And simply accept the idea that P as well, no, Q as well, P have coincident primary and secondary intentions. The argument against physicalism depends on this uh, assumption, okay? But this is not the assumption I would like to, to question here. Okay, then if this can be accepted, the primary and secondary intentions of P and non-Q coincide, and the truth of their star WVS implies the truth of set WV and S. Okay, this leaves intact the result obtained in the case of water and H2O. The primary intention of water is different from H2O, is different from its secondary intention. Maybe the primary intention or plausibly, the primary intention of H2O, of this term H2O, coincides with the secondary intention. But this is not the case of water, okay? Then we preserve the result so far. Water, water's not being H2O, is no real possibility. But P and non-Q is a real possibility, okay? Or describes a, a, a real possibility. Okay, a summary of the argument then will look like this. There, okay, there from a scenario V and P and non-Q is true. This means nothing more than P and non-Q is conceivable. Two, BP, the bridging principle is true. Let us assume the availability of a principle like BP. Okay, then, therefore, via their star WV, P, and non-Q is true. There is a word W sub V which corresponds to V 
And if V verifies P and non-Q, this word also verifies star P and non-Q. Where star W, W sub V, P and non-Q is true. Then you have four. The primary and the secondary intentions of P and non-Q coincide. Therefore, we can infer sat satisfaction for WV and P and non-Q is true. Therefore, possibly P and non-Q. Okay, it's possible that P and non-Q, and this is the negation of physicalism. This then is uh, a summary of the argument. But uh, what I would like to, 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 to question here is this premise, this bridging principle. Okay, I'll say something about this bridging principle, how this idea is articulated by, by David. Okay, the key element in the conceivability argument is PP. The main idea of a principle connecting the space of possible scenarios, that is maximally specific way things might be, and the metaphysical space constituted by possible worlds, that is maximally specific way things might be, is spelled out by Chalmers as follows. I quote, we could then say that our words W verifies a sentence token S when D implies S, where D is a canonical specification of W. This verifies here corresponds to my verifies star, okay? Because David himself makes no distinction between verify and verify star, but the point is not that big. I think only, the, uh, th 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 that's why I would say uh, in favor of, of my terminology, that it makes, makes clear that you have on the one hand scenarios, and on the other hand you have words. And these are different things. Yes. And there must be, of course, a principle linking these different things. This is the bridging principle. And this is how the bridge principle is characterized by Chalmers. You, ha you, you, you have a word, you describe this word canonically, you get D, and if D, the description, the canonical description of this word is in a certain logical relation, uh, the implication relation, with the sentence, the conceivable sentence S, then we say this word corresponds via the British principle to the scenario in question. Okay. Okay. The canonical specification of a word W is a complete specification of W framed exclusively in neutral terms. The latter are defined as expressions which are not twin earthable. That is, expressions that don't change the extension when used, the extension and the meaning, of course, when used by my twin in a twin Earth situation. Intuitively, water is twin Earthable. It's the main lesson of Putnam's example. No? But uh, while H2O and X, 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 Y, Z are aren't, okay, neutral. No, to in earth are neutral. They, this, this, this expression are neutral because they aren't to in earth -able. And the water isn't neutral because it is uh, to in earth -able. Okay. And on neutral terms, being non to in earth -able, neutral expressions have coincident primary and secondary intentions. As Chalmers puts it, they behave the same with respect to both verification and satisfaction, different from the, the twin earthable 
uh, expressions which behave differently. Okay. But this won't do as a definition. We need words corresponding to possible scenarios in the first place to get primary and secondary intentions and the associated notions of a verification, star, and satisfaction. If the words in question must be given to us in their canonical specifications, restricted as they are to neutral expressions, and if these neutral expressions are characterized in terms of the relation between their primary and secondary intentions, then we are moving in a circle. Okay, we need intentions to characterize the neutral terms. We need, we need the neutral terms to get to the canonical expressions. And, and we, we need these this words described in this way to, to have the, 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 the primary and the secondary intentions in the first place. So that we are, in a sense, moving in a circle. And this is admitted also by Chalmers. In this, in this paper I'm quoting, you recognize there is some circle here that maybe this can be clarified in another part of your, of your work. Anyway, even if, okay, this is recognized. Anyway, last remark seems to point to a problem for the conceivability argument. And this is the problem I would like to bring clearly to, to our mind. Okay. Uh, Chalmers' attempt to explain the relation between scenarios and words starts with a word W whose canonical specification D implies the conceivable S. This seems to presuppose that there is a possible world corresponding to every circumstance that can be consistently conceived. I owe this remark, by the way, to a passage by, by Howell in his book on subjective physicalism. Okay. The conceivability argument expresses the idea that when we are conceiving any non-contradictory sentence. We are envisioning a scenario V, but also somehow devising a metaphysically possible world W sub V, which can be tested for the satisfaction of X. And in some case, S is satisfied, for instance, in the case of F, P, and non-Q. In other cases, S is not satisfied in these words as in the case of water is different from H2O. Okay, anyway, it is the job, or it should be the job of BP to deliver these words. But then we can't begin the explanation of BP with the assertion that there is a real world corresponding to any conceivable scenario. It seems to me that as it should be shown that there is shown that there is a word corresponding to any scenario ever we can imagine. Okay. Then the problem is this. If the remarks above are okay, there are no good reasons, there are still no good reasons for the availability of the bridging principle in all generality. We can't be sure that there is a way to get to the required objective worlds starting from our imaginative conceptions, even under idealized, conce idealized conditions. In particular, we don't know whether the objective order contains a world corresponding to the scenario verifying P and non-Q. Maybe there is such a world Maybe there isn't. The conceivability argument simply assumes that there is, although it has no other way to characterize the required world than by saying it is the world that verifies the star and also satisfies P and non-Q. 
This comes close to assuming as a premise what should be the conclusion of the argument. Anyway, the whole apparatus, and I think it is remarkable, that the whole apparatus of canonical descriptions restricted to neutral terms implying the, conceivab the conceivable sentence plays no role in the characterization of the posited words. Everything we find there is, it is simply a zombie word. In a word, maybe there is a zombie word. Maybe there isn't. We don't know. But this, this means that the conceivability argument against physicalism is at best inconclusive. Thank you very much. And by the way, I want to remark that I haven't seen anything of Mendonça's work before, and it's amazing how much... No, please, uh, I, I can hear. Uh, it's just remarkable. I haven't seen uh, your this work uh, or anything you, you were saying about that. It's uh, The overlapping between our views is just it's pre pretty much the same thing. Okay. And this is good for me. Uh? And this is good for me. Yeah, I think you're... <laughs> well, I think you're just right, right? <laughs> Well, thank you, Wilson. That was, uh, that was remarkable. That's um, really wonderful analysis, very detailed, very careful. I think everything you said about the in exposition of my own view is completely correct. I hope the criticisms aren't completely correct. <laughs> but, you know, they, they may well be partially, partially correct, but uh, let's see if I can uh, resist them being completely correct, because that wouldn't be so good for me. <laughs> um, I'm just trying to get the, uh, exactly the point about the connection between BP, the bridging principle, and the other, BP is, and then the principle about scenarios to worlds. What was BP again, well, exactly? Exactly. A linking, a systematic linking between scenario. Oh, a systematic linking between scenarios and words. Yeah. Which says for each conceivable scenario, what's the word that okay somehow is actualized in your words when we conceive this scenario? Okay. So this this is BP. So there's initially CP that says when something is conceivable. It's possible. Then there it's possible, okay. or at least that there is a world that verifies it. Okay. Then there's various other principles, which basically, yeah, BP is just a somewhat more technical version of that that goes in terms of okay. scenarios. Says when you've got a scenario, then you have a world okay. that verifies it. And then the third, the third thesis you talked about at the end, the one that doesn't help with BP. I'm not sure that I have a third one. I have what's called metaphysical plenitude, but I think that's just BP. I mean, I don't think it, I've got any third principle that's meant to, uh, that's even purported to, yeah. to um, somehow get a bit deeper than BP and explain it. Yeah, I think B BP is corresponds very well to your metaphysical plenitude. The mm. metaphysical yep. plenitude yep. is the idea that for each scenario, there is a world a possible world. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then, in that sense, it's, it's the same. They, 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 they affect more or less the same. Okay. I was only... Okay. Then I would like to, to know, uh, how, do, how do you get this metaphysically possible world starting from the conceivability sentence? And I think, maybe I'm wrong in this, that the, the whole argument depends on the availability such a principle generally for any conceivable S, whether water is different from H2O or P and non Q or whatever, for any conceivable word, for any conceivable scenario, for any conceivable sentence that is a scenario, this is plenitude. Okay, Plen how do you 
get from plenitude to metaphysical plenitude. Yeah, that's okay. I, I thought it was... <laughs> I, I put this thing in terms of bridging principle, but you can put in terms of metaphysical plenitude. And I'm asking for the justification for metaphysical plenitude. Not sure. Adopting your, your yeah. way of, your terminology. I'm not sure that I exactly have an algorithm for coming up with the world, but there's a couple of different things that I can do. One is to break up the, um, the search for a world, so to speak, into two, into two components. And that's one thing I do in constructing the world. The first is a thesis that says, whenever you have a conceivable statement, um, you have some conceivable statement in purely semantically neutral terms, semantically neutral and indexical terms okay, that verifies okay. it. Now, so far I've said, I've said nothing there about metaphysical possibility, but then, um, then the, the further claim would be when you've got a s conceivable statement in semantically neutral terms, it's that same statement is metaphysically possible. Now, some may deny either or both of those theses, but if you're looking for an algorithm to deliver the world, okay. maybe that's about as, cl as close as I can to an algorithm. Find that semantically neutral sentence, originally taken to specify a conceivable scenario, reinterpret it as specifying a world, and then that's the world. Now, uh, you may question whether the, the thesis is correct, but does that come any closer to meeting your request for an algorithm? That delivers yeah, the world. Okay. Uh, uh, maybe I I, I, I I don't know whether I'm, I, I was addressing this point when I expressed some doubts about the availability of neutral terms. Mm. Okay. Of course, they are very decisive here, and it seems to me, of course, according to the definition you offered in this 2000 and I don't know. No, this uh, epistemic, the, the, the nature of epistemic mm. space. In this paper, you characterize neutral terms as terms that behave uh, the same with respect to verification and, and satisfaction. Okay, and my point was only that to have this notion of verification and satisfaction, you must have the primary and secondary intentions but to have this primary and second intentions, you need words. Uh, and then that seems to me some sort of circle. And I was very happy when I s read there that you, <laughs> you agree, there may be some circle. Then this way of putting things, uh, uh, maybe this, this well, I'm certain this will solve the problem, <laughs> but I would ask for a, 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 a better, uh, explanation of neutral terms. Mm. Okay. No, that's a perfectly reasonable uh, request for an explanation. I, I think there are certain potential circles here, but I don't think there's a circle in that the definition of neutral terms somehow relies on anything like the CP principle. I think the CP principle could be completely false, and we would still have we could still have a vocabulary of what I call epistemically rigid or super rigid terms. I mean, it might be that that first thesis I articulated was correct. There could be a bunch of epistemically rigid terms that somehow acquaint you with their referent. For every conceivable world, there would be a semantically neutral specification that verifies it, but that could be metaphysically impossible. I think that's all, that would all be consistent. So if there's a circle in characterizing semantically neutral terms, I don't think there's one that, re that is somehow resting on the CP principle or BP. Now it is true though that in, I mean I, I discussed this the most in constructing the world where I try to define what I call epistemically rigid terms and it's true that I don't have a great definition of them. It's one initial intuitive definition of them is an epistemically rigid term is one that has a constant primary intention, picks out the same object in every epistemically possible world. Of course that, and of course that is circular. Of course that's circular, okay. because I need epistemically rigid terms to define primary intention. So I need a better definition than that, and you know, the best I give is something like a, a term such that one can know its reference 
a priori, this um, reference, or the it's a priori that it's ref that that term, you know, the water is that thing, or that zero is is that thing, and it's not a fully not a fully satisfactory definition, but then it's not a completely unknown situation in philosophy to have notions that aren't fully satisfactory. But anyway, I, I, so I certainly concede this issue that the notion of epistemic rigidity is a tricky one. But then the question of the argument for BP and CP, I don't really see as so much going through there as through some other considerations. The argument, I say, well, the initial argument just consists in the observation that there's no obvious counterexample and that all the Kripke style potential yeah, counterexamples are in fact entirely consistent with this principle, so that counterexamples would require something much stronger. It's just an initial consideration, but one that I think carries weight. The further argument is the argument I give concerning modal monism and modal rationalism and thinking about the roots of our modal notions and their connections to rational notions. You talked a few times about whether objective modal space, you know, does it contain this, does it not, there's no way to know. This is a conception, I think, of, this potentially involves a conception of modality that I am inclined to reject. You know, the, modal, the possible world's kind of lying out there as little jewels out there in the, uh, in the world in the way that the laws of nature might. You know, I think that's not, in my view, that's kind of not how modality works. Modality is closer to being something like logic. It's rationally accessible, it's constitutively tied to our, our rationality, and therefore, it's so I suspect if there's a disagreement, it's going to, uh, it's going to lie there. But in any case, insofar as, you're inter insofar as the argument for these principles is, uh, is what's at issue, that's, that's the place where I think the argument um, I give is, is to be found. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. I'll have to give that, that a look at uh, this consideration in constructing the, the words, whether they, okay, go beyond this, as you agree, or more or less circular definition of neutral terms. <laughs> okay, but concerning, okay, then I, I have to see whether the argument is still, <laughs> has some force, maybe not, <laughs> but anyway. Uh, but now concerning the, 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 this idea that uh, uh, you mentioned, uh, maybe I'm assuming, uh, my picture is that the words, the, the possible words are there. You know. okay. okay, there's something uh, uh, really misleading in my formulation. Whenever I, 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 I mention these words, I, I, I use the, the word ex objective expressible, uh, objective words. I wasn't, when I was using this objective expression to uh, relating to, to, to this word, I was not uh, endorsing uh, some moral realism, Lewisian, controversial version of, of moral realism. I was only trying to make a distinction between conceivable scenarios which are, of course, even under idealized conditions, more or less subjective. We can conceive. <laughs> we are more or less free to conceive. And okay, a distinction between things as we conceive them and things as they are independently of our conceptions. This is not the same as buying this picture of, of, of modern realism. Uh, mo mo uh, model, re model realism. Uh, perhaps I, 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 I had to formulate this uh, more carefully, but it's not part of, of my, uh, my view. This strong view that the metaphysical possible words are somehow there or that they, 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 they have, uh, but I think they, well, they are somehow independent from our, from our conceptions. That's only this is what I mean. I guess I'd like to think, yeah, they are independent to a certain extent of our conceptions, the way that, say, logic is independent, independent. Okay. of our conceptions. It's not something about the mind that makes logic okay. true, but it's still within our grasp. It's yeah. not sort of 
totally, it's not like a logic is a world out there logic. that our minds can never yeah. potentially bridge to and could somehow be completely wrong about the way that we could be completely wrong about contingent reality. And that view, my, on my view, modality is a bit more like logic and a bit less like, say, yeah. say physics. But maybe yeah. that's going to be where fundamentally our disagreement lies. So I'd be very curious um, to hear at some point what you think about those considerations for what I call modal rationalism in terms of issues like okay. that. Yeah, I agree with you. That could change the picture. And, uh, <laughs> now I can say <laughs> how I, I, I should rephrase the whole thing. You know. But I thank you very much for your thanks for your service. Thanks. I thought that was, I thought that was really great. Um, the lights. Okay. Uh, one thing I was. So you, the one way you framed it that I thought maybe could be made more helpful for me is you framed it as it's a there's a circularity in the definition of ver star. Uh, of verification star. Oh, there is a, there is a circularity in the definition of neutral terms. That's ah. neutral terms, this definition anyway. When you define neutral terms as, as terms that behave the same uh, with relation to satisfaction, uh, to, to, to verification and to satisfaction, it seems to be circular because the nation of verification and satisfaction depend on canonical description and canonical description of this term. Of this term. Uh, okay, this, this is the point. Circular, my point of view, so is only the, 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 the definition of neutral terms in this context. And that's circular because verification star is defined in terms of neutrality and neutrality is defined in terms of verification. Yeah. But does, isn't that immediately going to entail that there's a circularity in verification star because that's going to be entailed in terms of neutrality? No, no, please. Ah. Not so quick. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so if you have that neutrality is defined in terms of verification star, and verification star is defined in terms of neutrality, then you'll get both a circle in the definition of verification star ah, okay. and a circle in the definition of neutrality. Okay. Um, I guess one thing that would help me is, uh, I guess two things. One thing that would help me is if um, I could see how in the argument, uh, in the argument for two-dimensionalism, that creates a problem. I mean, for uh, sorry, for uh, uh, for dualism, that creates a problem because I suspect it does. I suspect there's a step where something doesn't follow. Um, I, I'm having trouble seeing exactly where that is. I'm having trouble seeing so exa exactly where that is. It, um, if, I, if I, yes. I put my summary of the argument again? Yes. There we go. Ah, yeah, good. That's fine. Okay. Would you like to comment or should I? S so, situation so. Uh, number one, premise number one. Premise number one is the same as. Uh, Plenitude. Right. For any conceivable sentence, there is a scenario. And if there is a scenario, there is a scenario that verifies this sentence S. So this is no problematic. I take plenitude to be a principle that is almost definitional. <laughs> it's defined the way scenarios are connected to sentences that verify this. So the, the first premise, or I, it's yeah. no problematic at all, yeah. okay? Then the second premise is this is British principle. Because you need to infer a metaphysically possible world, W sub V from V, in order to apply this, in order to, yeah, apply right. this 
to see whether this word is related, the word WV, W sub V, is related to P and on Q according to this relation, their star. So, so that means... It is in a sense, it's too, it's, it's too much. For instance, David yes. doesn't distinguish right. between their and their star. He defines initially their right. as a relation between scenarios and sentences. Right. But he extends this definition to cover also worlds. Right. I put a, a, a <laughs> something in between only to make clear that you have to make you have to, to make this step from scenarios to worlds. The bridge, the bridge principle says for any conceivable scenario, there is a corresponding world. W sub V. Okay. In a sense, I, I, I'm putting things <laughs> different from the way uh, uh, Dave, uh, Dave says, scenarios can be constructed out of a world. <laughs> uh, this is how he, you know, he put things. But I think uh, the idea can only be that you conceive a sentence, any sentence, whatever, okay? You are free to conceive, okay. You consistently conceive, the sentence must be conceive, uh, consistent and non-contradictory non and so on and so on. Okay, but within these limits, you conceive a sentence, okay? Then we'll have to see whether there is a world corresponding to this sentence. And then we'll test whether in this world corresponding to this sentence, there is the relation of satisfaction. If there is also the relation of satisfaction, and then in that case, the, the, the word WV is a word that verifies the sentence and also a word that satisfies the sentence. That is, it is possible that there is a word in which this sentence S is true. For instance, P and non-Q. This, the, the main point of value. And this... I guess what I'm having trouble seeing is how the circularity in the definition is going to affect the move from three and four to five. I suspect that that's going to be where the problem lies. I suspect y y you have identified something that some assumption is going to be made. And if This is what Chalmers says. We could then say that a word W verifies a sentence. In my terminology, verifies the star a sentence. But this is no big deal, okay? A word W, not a scenario, a word W verifies a sentence token S when D implies S, where D is a canonical specification of W. Then I would like, okay, then what, what, what this means? A canonical specification. A canonical specification is a complete specification of a world exclusively in neutral terms. And there I saw the circularity. You can't define neutral terms without assuming the whole apparatus of, of primary and secondary intentions and so on and so on and so on. Uh, and you need already these words to define these primary and secondary intentions. That's the point. That's my circularity objection, let's say. Ah, it is, okay. Thank you. So it was a very interesting talk, and um, um, I, I would like to make a remark that doesn't engage with all the technical detail, which I would love to 
understand in detail, but I'm not sure I'm grasping it all. But, but I had a sense of the general shape of um, the argument, and I just want to see if you would agree with that, that, that what you're trying to say is that, um, that what, what you're looking for is some sort of grounds for the, let's say, the CP principle or, or, or uh, you know, that, you know, yep. some central, some, some um, crucial um, premise uh, that would yield, you know, the, the, the conclusion for the failure of physicalism. So you're looking for some sort of neutral ground that would justify those crucial premises. And what you're saying is that there, you know, any kind of ground that you can see already assumes uh, something like <laughs> the CP principle, or something like you know, however you know, whatever formulation of that crucial principle um, is there to derive the fa failure of physicalism. So in in a way, what you're saying is that what what goes in comes out. What what <laughs> what what goes in comes out. You, you that you don't have new that that um, that Dave has not provided grounds that any rational person who do doesn't already assume the truth of the CP principle would have to go along with and, and adopt the CP principle. So, so there is no neutral grounds. And so, so, so what you're saying is, is in a way uh, very much consistent with, with, uh, with uh, what I was trying to argue earlier that there this is This again is good for me. <laughs> that what I was trying to argue earlier that that um, that uh, that a rational person, a reasonable person, can fail to assume the CP principle um, and get along metaphysically just quite well, you know, such as a physicalist, for example. So, so what what you <coughs> are looking for and haven't found is a neutral ground which would compel the adoption of the CP principle. Would, would you agree no, with see that? I'm, I'm, I'm not sure whether I, I would agree with this formulation. Let me put it like this. The CP principle, okay, the argument anyway, that uh, <coughs> the first formulation of the conservability argument is if it's conceivable, if it, it is possible, if it is possible, then physicalism is false, more or less, okay? But a, m uh, a, m uh, a more refined formulation of the, of the, the argument goes like this. P and non Q is conceivable one, huh? it's conceivable one. If P and non Q is conceivable one, then P and non Q is possible one, and then there's this extra premise. If it is possible one, it is possible two. And possible two is metaphysical possibility. Possible one is only, has to do only with scenario, etc. I, okay. Many people say, no, th th there's no way to, to, to go from, from possibility one to possibility two. But as David formulated, the explains all the thing with possibility one, possibility two. This assumes that possibility, okay, let's put it another way. Uh, possibility one is epistemic possibility, scenarios, okay? And possibility two is metaphysical possibility, has to do with the words, okay? Questioning, okay, this, the availability of this British principle is, in a sense, questioning this this transition. From that's that's the idea. But okay, I I I <coughs> as I try to formulate, uh, this is no argument that there isn't a world corresponding to the scenario described by P and on Q. My argument is only that maybe there is such a world, but we don't know. We don't know because we don't have a workable uh, British principle. Maybe there is such a world, maybe there isn't. 
This is not the same as uh, the, the argument is totally wrong. Uh, the argument is inconclusive until we find this, this connection. You see. A few would like to object immediately. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just just one thing that, that okay. so so I would have I got a little confused because I would have thought that the physicalist would uh, get off the train at the at the one possibility of of a zombie scenario or of a zombie world. Yeah. Of of the claim that there are zombies. Okay. So, that, so uh, not not the transition from one one possible to two possible, but the, but the transition from scenario to ah okay yeah it depends on, on it depends on the physicalism we have whether this is materialism A from type A or from type B materialists from type A are posteriori from uh, physicalist they accept that there is possibility one huh? type B accept that there is possibility one oh. what they didn't accept what they they can't accept is that you can infer possibility two from possibility one, metaphysical possibility from the possibility. Possibility one but is the epistemic no, gap. Yeah. Ah, yeah. okay. Right, so that's why. Okay. Right. Then you put already the that's thing right. there. Okay. Right. Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah, but, but that doesn't affect the point. You know, that's the main point. No? Okay. Yeah, just um, following up on, I think especially on Brian's point, but also on something. Carty said. I think one way to bring out, I think, what Brian, so I'll try to partly bring out what something Brian was getting at and partly then offer a potential response for you. Um, so, I mean, if you break down, I mean, I find it useful to break down these bridging principles into the two steps that I mentioned. One is just moving from whenever there's an epistemically possible sentence or epistemically possible scenario, there's an epistemically possible scenario fully specified in semantically neutral terms, ah. plus indexical. I've said nothing yet about metaphysical possibility, okay. Okay. just epistemic possibility. Okay. And that's a thesis that in the book I call super rigid scrutability yeah. in constructing the world. The second thesis says once you've got a scenario, any sentence in super rigid terms or semantically neutral terms, it's epistemically possible if and only if it's metaphysically possible. Okay. And those, I think, are really two distinct steps. Okay. And one the second one is really the one that's most closely tied to conceivability entails possibility. Mm -hmm. The first one is more tied just to the very notion of neutrality. So Brian was saying, why does questioning this notion of neutrality really tend to undermine the CP-style argument? So one way to think about this now is, insofar as you're Worrying there's a circularity in the very definition of the notion of neutrality, or it's not well defined, the it's going to come in already step. at the uh, at the first step. Maybe it have some effect on the second step, but it seemed it would come in, especially at that at that uh, that first step. Um, maybe it would also affect the second. Anyway, but now the thing on on your behalf, how would this substantively affect the argument? Well, one way to think about what the argument is going to have to do: you start with p and not q. And then okay. we make our first step saying there's something semantically neutral that verifies it. Now, many people have been inclined to think that at the very least Q, if not P, okay. are themselves already semantically neutral, and that's enough to make the first step and then the second step go through. But in the um but now adopting your worries about this very notion of neutrality, you might say, Well, how can you be so sure? That's that Q, Q is, neutral. is neutral, that our concept of consciousness okay. is in fact neutral. I and mean back in the old days when you did it in terms of two-dimensional this and that, it might have looked kind of plausible, okay. but now that that definition was circular and we need to understand it some other way, okay. like in terms of epistemic rigidity, um, well, you've got to give it some other more substantive characterization. How do we know it satisfies that? One characterization would be, for example, well, we can know exactly what it is a priori. And uh, that's something like a transparency or a revelation thesis <laughs> about the concept 
of consciousness. Not many people have found such a thesis, at least somewhat plausible or intuitive. Okay. But you might also take merely assuming such a thesis to be somewhat uh, okay. to be somewhat problematic in the context of an argument against physicalism or dualism. Okay. Because once okay. you've got something like a phenomenal concept or totally transparent, you already have a very quick argument against physicalism okay. in uh, in hand. So that's anyway, that's how I, th I think you might be able to use this kind of consideration okay. to, uh, to, bring to help bring this out. And I said a few, I think there's various things I can say in response. This came up in a dialectic in an exchange with Goff and Papineau a few years ago in the journals where I basically conceded there being a kind of a worry in this vicinity and said a few things in okay. response. But maybe that at least captures, helps, um, helps me see at least what you're getting at with your worries about, about neutrality. Was this a question? Whether this, this yeah, discussion? No, well it's no, but I no. <laughs> I, I, I don't know the discussion, the debate between you and Papino. Uh, or I, I, I can't say. Uh, uh, perhaps, but perhaps that helps. Perhaps that's the kind of, that at least brings out a way in which your worry about the circularity okay. and definition of neutrality okay. could actually impact. Then, the then it's not a question, it's a recommendation. Okay, I agree. <laughs> I accept your recommendation. Uh, and and uh, one thing, uh, what do you think of? Uh, uh, you just uh, assumed that you can, uh, given a certain uh, scenario, that it, there is a role that's going to be associated to. So the verification satisfaction relation. Yeah. This part you granted because you. This were part is granted. This part is plenitude. Right. But uh, what I'm I'm thinking is if uh, there is no problem with the circularity, uh, maybe. You shouldn't grant that because that would be the weak spot, right? I mean, it's pretty much my strategy because this link here. Uh, this link, well, it's plenitude, this link between conceivability and scenarios. Uh, from scenarios to world. Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah well. it's just because if the bridge stands, uh, you've got to block it somewhere. And I think maybe that's the point to block the argument, right? Uh, not to allow this or. In my case, I was arguing that this uh, roles they, they will never get to the roles you will have under ah, okay. they will be under the okay. Maybe argument yeah. that it's just because without particulars, without a reference yeah. to particulars, you don't have. Yeah. A I'm just asking, like, uh, suppose the bridge is actually fine and it stands. Uh, do you have any other strategy? No, but you think if your point is good, I mean that. Uh, 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 a description of 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 a, of a world. Entirely, uh, an entirely canonical, entirely neutral description of what wouldn't give us uh, the reference we need to. So that this is this is says no word. Okay. okay. This is not the same as assuming that the bridge. Stays no, sure, sure. Th those are different things. What I'm saying okay. is, uh, as suppose that David can save the the bridge. Uh, uh, connection. So he he got a nice bridge. So it's no, bridge. No, no. Okay. So what you no. are saying, I, I got a point. Is that there is another way of approaching this question of neutral terms, huh? which is not so circular. When you appeal to how do you call it? transparency, immediacy, or whatever. Okay, you define canonical descriptions, or you define the neutral terms, not in terms of primary and secondary intention uh, behaving the same relative to this, but in purely epistemic terms, assuming, of course, that we have uh, some immediate, direct access to the objects of certain concepts, at least, at least, uh, then that's why uh, that would show that, that Q is a, a, a case for, for uh, Q could, could be part of a canonical description, because it's only part, né? because a canonical description is a complete description. And, but P don't, because you wouldn't uh, huh? accept the idea of transparency and all the things <laughs> for, for physical terms. That's why I, I thought, that's why he was saying, there's another way, not so blatantly circular, <laughs> to introduce the neutral terms 
which we need for the canonical description and in, the, in that sense to avoid the circularity as I try to give it. Am I <laughs> reproducing your? I think there's another way to characterize the neutral terms. And these days I normally do it with, in terms of epistemic rigidity or yeah. super rigidity. But there okay. is a question about, I think, I think the notion of a epistemically rigid designator can be made just as clear as the notion of, say, a metaphysically rigid designator. It's more or less parallel. Um, so I think that's not a bad situation to be in. But the question then does come up as to what the epistemically rigid designators are. And I'm very strongly inclined to think that consciousness is, but it's at least possible for some opponents to deny okay, that consciousness no, I agree, is I agree, I an epistemically okay. rigid. No, no, I not I every type being materialist needs to. Some of them, okay. I think, can accept that it's epistemically rigid, but still deny the conceivability possibility principle for super rigid designators. You actually get two different forms of yeah. Defining neutral terms. Of yeah. physicalism here. Also, it's not required that P and Q themselves be neutral or super rigid. I mean, in the case of P, I think it's not, but there's probably going to be some underlying structural or yeah. structural plus okay. quiddity description of the world from which P yeah. will itself be scrutable. And it could even turn out that way for Q. Maybe there's some underlying kind of proto proto phenomenal. Something like that from which ah, Q okay. is scrutable. But yeah. this kind, but this particular kind of physicalist that I'm now thinking about might want to deny there's any such neutral or super okay. rigid characterization okay. in the vicinity of the mind. It's something you can only ever know opaquely. Never know the element transparently. If you went that way, okay. then um, at least okay. there would be a vicinity in the worry of ep a worry in the vicinity of epistemic rigid oh, okay. rigidity. I think I got the point. But I wonder I would like to ask what the relation between super rigidity and neutrality one implies the other, but vice versa too. Super rigid expressions are semantically neutral. Not every semantically neutral term that is, is um, super rigid. Super rigid because neutral super. terms can vary in their extension across worlds. So just say we had a, ah, okay. a property which is which is uh, super rigid, like let's say being okay. a philosopher always okay. picks out the same um, the same property in every world. Now get the corresponding general term like philosopher. Let's say its extension is a class. Okay. It might pick out a different class, okay. so that term won't be uh, won't be super rigid, but it may still be semantically neutral because the primary intention okay. and the secondary intention. But the relation the goes this way: super rigidity yeah. implies implies neutrality. semantic neutrality. But and furthermore, not the other way around. That's right. But I think for every semantically neutral term, it's very plausible there'll be a super rigid term okay. nearby, and much the way that it came out in that last example. Ultimately, I think the notion of a super rigid term is a bit clearer. It's a matter of picking out the same thing in all worlds, all scenarios, all, all everything. Same thing with a, prior, a priority and necessity. So I find it a somewhat more intuitive notion, at least. Than okay. Well, unless, unless you define super, rigidi super rigidity in terms of the diagonal yeah. being coincident, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 then you come to the right. I agree that's circular. <laughs> On the other hand, I also think, I also think it's somewhat intuitive. But I also think it's somewhat intuitive, which is why it's not entirely circular. And the reason that's somewhat intuitive is we do have intuitions about what would be the case if certain possible worlds okay. were actual. And I think when, okay. we, when we consider that, we're basically considering the world in a neutral way, which is to say that we're bringing, okay. maybe we're bringing to bear some antecedent grasp on neutrality or epistemic rigidity. So, you know, it's a, yeah, maybe there's a circle there, but it's a circle which has some intuitive points to hop on and hop off. I'd, this is something we find with lots of other circles. I mean, circularity itself isn't so bad as long as there's some substantive Another way entry to points. To get to yeah. the rigidity. Okay. Yeah, yeah merciful. <laughs> I, I can see another argument for Dave in the vicinity, which just drops all the semantic apparatus and just argues that from a true, as complete as possible, physical description of our world, using whatever current physics is, there's no a priori entailment of the, where the where of, of any beings being conscious. Uh, of course, there's no proof of that, but it looks like that puts the burden on the uh, 
the, the physicalist who accepts the, the connection between a periodicity and necessity to produce an a priori, uh, um, to, to show that, in fact, you can derive the conscious, consciousness properties are instantiated by a priori. A priori. This would be in support of the conservability argument. Another way of putting things it's so that at the end we, we would. It's but putting uh, the burden. What's on the, the conclusion of this one? That physicalism is false, or that physicalism is true about it the phenomena? It's that physicalism is false. It's a challenge ah, okay. to physicalism. Ah, we are on the same page. Okay, but it is. It does employ the connection between necessity and opportunity. Okay, I understand. This is another okay. way of and seeing the thing. And the reason for for that, as Dave was saying earlier, is because it makes for a, a good account, an interesting, I don't know, one could argue for it from, a, from, from wanting a good <coughs> epistemology of modality. But I think Dave, when he was made his first remark to you, was said that you were sort of imagining that there were the facts about necessity were already sort of objective in the world. Yeah, okay. and but, but, but that really didn't have to do with being a realist about possible worlds, it's had to do with the objective objectivity of necessity. And um, then it's, it's a question, how are we gonna find out about it? I think Dave's view, if I understood him right, mm -hmm. is that our concept of necessity already has built into it our way of finding out about what's ne necessary. And he's mm -hmm. worked out a, a, a way in which it's built in, and that's what the, what the account has. So I was just thinking that the argument, there's another argument in the vicinity, which just okay. is a, a challenge to the physicalist who accepts the uh, epistemology of modality that um, mm -hmm. that that Dave likes, and I li okay. I like it too, actually. Embarrassing to say um, that um, that that makes a challenge for the for the physicalist. Yeah. Okay. May, may force but anyway, may force this is another argument, as this argument yeah. which starts with conservability and so forth. Okay. Of, of course, I, 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 <laughs> I don't have answers to all possible options. <laughs> 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 I, <Yeah. laughs> I don't know, of course not. It's a nice one. I tried to scrutinize the argument as I could. <laughs> as, I, as, I, as I think I was fair to your formulation, maybe. <laughs> and okay. Oh, j maybe just a follow-up. Uh, his uh, argument, I think, uh, will just get the, uh, the constraint we need in this conceivable uh, world uh, uh, so that they, they it will now conceive metaphysically possible worlds because now it's constrained by fundamental physics and whatever. So in this case, I think the link from the uh, what's conceivable and metaphysical possibility could, could be granted. Yeah, but okay. The, and but the problem yeah, is okay. uh, the way but this is not the notion of no, but that's the thing. His notion is just what you know involves no a priori uh, yeah. contradiction. It is just logical, actually. Uh, okay. Uh, conceivability. So yeah, if you add the whole thing, uh, of, you know, fundamental physics and everything, actually, you're going to deliver the f no. Uh, his metaphysically notion, possible. Yeah, Davis' notion has more than any uh, non-contradictory. It is uh, some uh, a sentence is conceivable when when the denial of this sentence cannot be uh, ruled out known a priori. Yeah, yeah. A priori. Yeah, but the idea is consistency. It's just consistent. simply consistent. Yeah, yeah. No, no. OK. Anyone else? All right. So. Claudia. Hmm. Uh, so. We're gonna take a picture on stage with all the speakers, so I would like to invite all of them to come here to up front. Uh, and uh, I would like, on behalf of the organizing committee, <laughs> uh, to really thank you all, not only the speakers. I actually, I felt like naming each one of you personally because I feel like very much uh, thankful for you coming. You, you made this a really special moment for all of us organizing this event. And I would like to thank the audience too. I mean, all these people coming, the students, uh, really thank you for coming. And I, I really hope you enjoyed the conference. Two things. 
Okay, first of all, I want to thank Wilson for an absolutely marvelous talk. Thanks. <laughs> Second, I want to say what a great pleasure and privilege this conference has been for me to have all, the, uh, all these marvelous talks and discussion engaging with my work and just for more generally as a wonderful occasion for philosophy, so many interesting discussions. And really, all the credit for that has to go to our three organizers, Marco, Rodrigo, Gustavo. I think we all owe them a great <laughs> vote of thanks. Thank you.